Okay, so hello everyone. I, I hope you've had a wonderful day and I hope you've had a wonderful night shopping. I know it's uh, also quite still early in your, on your end. And so today is a great day because, uh, wow, we are really addressing a very interesting topic. Um, and it's quite interesting because, you know, we don't really talk so much about it when we are uh, engaging in, you know, EMR. Uh, there are very few times that we talk about it and uh, uh, it's a very key um, space that we can use, especially in advocacy, and that is media. And also excited, uh, at least we have uh, someone who I really look up to uh, very much and uh, and she has really mentored me and, uh, you know, provided me with a lot of links and I, I look up to her work and I hope to uh, embrace what she does uh, in, in the future, the near future. So thank you so much, Robin, for joining us today. I'll just introduce you to the guests. For those who may not know you, then I think we'll start. So our guest today is Robin Benghaus, and I hope I spell this second name correctly, Robin. Uh, so Robin reads uh, communication strategies for CarboX, which is a global and profit dedicated to addressing the health threat of drug resistant bacteria. And throughout her career, Robin has written feature articles and produced documentaries that translate complex ideas into compelling human stories. So her projects have garnered multiple awards and have been exhibited at international film fe festivals on PBS, I know we have seen PBS documentaries and as part of Alfred P. Sloan, a foundation science on screen. She serves as a film envoy for American Film Showcase, a cultural diplomacy program produced by the U.S. Department of State and Embassies to promote a STEM education, entrepreneurship, and human rights with global communities. And she has served as a production consultant, keynote speaker, distinguished lecturer, and jury for film festivals, university, and non and nonprofits. And Robin has an interdisciplinary background in science and film. So she has a Bachelor of Science in Biology, and uh, she did a, a master's in MFA in film production from Boston University. So thank you so much, Robin, and thanks so much for uh, joining us today. I'm really excited for this session. And over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was a really nice introduction. I feel really welcome. And I wanted to test my audio. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I'm really appreciative of all the work that your group has been doing to educate about antibiotic resistance and inspire positive action. So it's really an honor to be here and um, to talk to you about media strategies for helping to educate and get the word out about antibiotic resistance. And so what I would like to say is that during the presentation, if you have questions, uh, we will reserve time at the end. But if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat. And, you know, Daniel will be moderating the, the chat. So you can interrupt me um, at any time. And uh, Great, so I, I will move ahead with the presentation. And let me review some of the things that I will cover. Daniel already gave a really comprehensive background uh, about, uh, about me. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about CARBEX. And um, what I will do is provide some advice for how we can speak about antibiotic resistance based on research that has been conducted. And um, I'd like to spend most of the presentation talking about different kinds of media platforms, including video, radio, podcasts, um, local and global news outlets, and schools. So as you all are thinking about ideas and ways for you to reach your local and global communities, uh, there'll be some very specific examples and also contacts so that you can get started right away. Um, so I hope that this presentation will give you some basic tools, but you are also welcome to contact me and I will reach out to my network to help you uh, if you have questions in the future about projects that you're developing. Um, so I, as Daniel said, I lead communications for CARBEX. We, we are a global nonprofit organization led by Boston University and we address antimicrobial resistance, 
Uh, we were founded in 2016 to try to help the broken antibiotic pipeline. And so, you know, e even though antibiotics have saved millions of lives since they were invented in the 40s, um, antibiotic companies have been filing for bankruptcy and that's stalled innovation. And there's a uh, main reason for that is that it takes uh, about 10 years and more than $1 billion to translate an idea from a lab into an approved antibiotic for patients. Um, and once those new drugs are approved, um, doctors often wanna hold them on the shelves for as long as they can and not prescribe them until the old antibiotics no longer work. And they're doing that for a good reason. And that is to try to slow the spread of antibiotic resistance. Uh, but because of that, it's hard for the companies to recover the costs that are involved in developing the new drugs. Um, so what Carbex has been doing is it's really trying to spur innovation um, in this area. And so we, um, when we were founded, we were supported initially by the U.S. government and Welcome, and we've expanded that support. So we have more funding that comes in from the, the um, United Kingdom, from the German government, and also from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And so they fund Carbax to provide non-dilutive funding, which really is just no strings attached grants um, for new projects, new antibiotics, vaccines, rapid diagnostics, and other non-traditional products that are all aimed at addressing antibiotic resistance. Uh, and so we have an in-house R&D team and we have subject matter experts around the globe that, um, that can help these companies. Many of them are really small, five to 20 employees. Um, many have come out of universities and their spin outs, and they have a lot of knowledge about the science and the technology, their foundational science and technology, but maybe not necessarily about the drug discovery and development process. So we help them to accelerate their projects. And so Daniel told you a little bit about me. Uh, I have a degree in biology and um, another degree in film production. I've um, directed independent documentaries, written feature stories and news articles. And I got my start after graduate school actually working for Boston University. And I produced short videos and I wrote stories for their main news publications. And these are them on screen. Boston University has a, a news site called BU Today and an alumni magazine called um, Bostonia. And these are some of the examples of the stories that I've produced. You know, when I was working for Boston University, I really could pitch ideas, um, uh, stories that interested me that had some kind of tie to the university. So, you know, I, I went behind the scenes to do a profile on uh, the photographer who is a Boston University alumnus for the Boston Red Sox and um, talk to him about some of the strategies that he employs for photographing baseball games. Um, I was able to profile um, some American Sign Language interpreters and to do a story about uh, all the preparation that's involved in them getting ready to um, sign and perform a, a show so that it's accessible for deaf audiences. Uh, and then I, I went to Mexico with Boston University dental students who were providing free dental care and education for children in a village called Teacapan. So really, as long as the, the ideas that I had um, that I wanted to pitch had some relationship to the university, my editors were, were really supportive and, um, and, and usually approved my pitches so that I could produce them. So what I'd like to, to talk with you today, before we start um, going through some examples in different media platforms, uh, I'd like to, to talk about some basic ideas for communication that I think could be helpful for you when you're thinking about how you want to educate your communities and, um, and, and how to do that. So I, there are some really basic elements, and that is um, you want to think about who your audience is. And, and what your message is going to be. So what do you want to educate your audience about? And then you want to think about it based on who your audience is, where does your audience get its information? Um, and so that will drive the kinds of um, platforms that you look into. And I, I wanted to share uh, a study that was uh, a research study 
um, that was carried out by Welcome. Um, the way we use language can really impact the way people think, feel, and act. And so how we talk about drug-resistant infections plays a really crucial role in raising public awareness. People need to understand what drug infections are, um, that they're not limited to one illness or country, and that, they have, that they're affecting people now. And so Welcome um, is a global charitable foundation that supports science to solve urgent health challenges, including antibiotic resistance. And um, they really wanted to know how people understand antibiotic resistance and what are some effective ways we could talk about it to um, increase understanding and education and also um, inspire action. So they, the researchers spoke with 12,000 people from seven countries around the world, including Kenya, um, and they developed these five tips um, on messaging. And I have also, I would like you to know, I sent my presentation to Daniel and there are links throughout the presentation so we can share that with you. Um, so there is a reference to this study, a 30 page report if you wanna go through it um, later, you can and a, a video that breaks these principles down. Um, but we'll go through these one by one. So, um, so first, and you know, antibiotics have saved millions of lives since they were invented, and people will understand the gravity of the situation about resistance when they start to understand the impact that resistance has on the treatments we all rely on. So one example um, that's given is you can frame the discussion on how resistance undermines modern medicine by saying something like cancer treatments are failing as drug resistant infections rise. Um, and there are a number of, of um, modern medical innovations, dialysis, surgery, organ transplants, um, controlling sepsis and other chronic diseases. You know, all of these things rely on antibiotics, but you can, you can talk about the importance of antibiotics by focusing on how um, without antibiotics that undermines all of these innovations in modern medicine. Another, another tip is to explain the science and the fundamentals succinctly. So very clearly and, and using simple language, you know, to reach a wide audience, it's really important to use terms that people in their communities understand. And when the science is easy to understand, people are, are more likely to get behind the issue. And so one thing that you could say is bacteria that cause illnesses change over time and they develop the ability to evade the drugs that are designed to kill them. So just really boiling down resistance into very simple terms. And people are also um, more likely to take action when they feel that the issue is personal and that it affects their family, their friends, and themselves. Um, you know, if they know that bacterial infections could you know, impact the health of their mother, their father, and, and people of all different ages, babies, children, the elderly, you know, COVID has also taught us lessons like this, that viruses and bacteria travel across borders. So none of us um, are immune to it. And so one simple way is just to tell people that drug resistant infections are putting all of us at risk. Uh, the fourth key tip um, is to focus on what's happening right now and, and not, not about what will happen in the future, that the problem's getting worse in the future. Uh, people often postpone work that is not deemed urgent. <laughs> so when a threat is considered uh, immediate or imminent, the issue becomes a priority for today. Um, so, so you can say people are already dying from drug resistant infections. Um, as more drugs stop working, more lives will be put in danger. And the last tip that this study um, suggests is to encourage people to act now. Uh, people are much more likely to engage and spread the word when they feel like the issue is urgent, but that there is hope. Um, so you can discuss this by saying, we can get ahead of the problem and then offer some really um, practical things people can do, you know, washing their hands, uh, practicing hygiene, getting vaccinated, uh, 
educating people on how to use antibiotics correctly, um, and also letting them know we need to invest in new antibiotics. So there are many different ways that we can educate um, to raise awareness about antibiotic resistance. Uh, we can write op-eds, guest articles, or suggest ideas for reporters to cover this topic. Um, we can serve as guests on radio shows, podcasts, um, video TV shows. Uh, we can also reach out to people in our communities uh, through theater, classrooms, and, um, and community activities. So for example, if you wanted to reach a global health audience, you, know, you could write an opinion piece um, or serve as a guest on a podcast. If you wanted to educate children in your town, you could volunteer to lead activities in schools. Uh, so this is one example um, you know, uh, about classroom activities and um, you know, things to consider if you wanna educate children. You really wanna think about what, what are the simple messages that you want them to learn and consider how children learn. Um, often, Times interactive activities are effective because kids like to play and have fun and their attention spans typically are short. Um, so this is a screenshot from a project that I, I produced in Mexico. I went there with a group of dental students from Boston University. Um, it was over a six week period where they traveled to Mexico and they do it every year to provide free dental care for, for children in a village called Teacapan. Um, but they also visit schools, and so they use that as an opportunity to educate about hygiene, dental hygiene, um, and they um, they ensure too that the the students who go are bilingual, so they can communicate in the students' native language. So I have a one minute video clip that shows uh, a demonstration um, in the school, so you can get a sense for how they were doing that to reach and educate children. Unfortunately, the cultural idea here is to give kids in their baby bottles coke. So we see a lot of rampant decay. So we thought it would be an important aspect of our presence here in the town, not only to make a difference by giving free dental treatment, but also to go to schools and give them an educational component. Okay, ustedes me dicen, Coca-Cola. Buena o mala? <laughs> mala, no buena, mala. Tiene mucha azúcar. El azúcar es horrible para los dientes. Se come, los, les pica los dientes, ¿ok? Yo sé que sabe rica, pero es mala para los dientes. Cuando no se lavan los dientes, este es un bichito, este es otro bichito. Traten de quitarse los, los bichitos, muévanse. Exactamente. Si no se cepillan los dientes, los bichitos no se salen de los dientes. Y por eso es necesario cepillarnos dos veces al día, ¿ok? So there, there are examples of classroom outreach online and um, some, some of these resources already exist. So if you're interested in talking to students in your communities and reaching out to classes, uh, you know, it would be important to get permission from the schools, um, maybe talk to the principals, find out what they're already learning and how you might supplement that. Um, and this is one example, there's a group called Superheroes Against Superbugs. And it's uh, a group that's based in India, a program that launched to educate about antibiotic resistance. And they've created lessons and hands-on hands activities for ninth grade students in India. Um, some of these include creating comics, stories, and plays. Um, and the, the goal is not only to educate the children about antibiotic resistance, but they know that when these children uh, are done with the day, they're going to go home and they're going to tell their parents, their family and friends about what they learned that day. And they'll have comics and art to share. So there, this is a, a really great opportunity for cross um, generational education. Uh, so I encourage you, there's a, a website there, superheroesagainstsuperbugs.com. Uh, I encourage you to go there and check out the materials 
they're all free to use and share. And the, there, there is an email address there that the, the program welcomes your feedback. So if you have, uh, if you use them and you want to let them know how that went, um, please do reach out to them. Uh, there's another um, resource that you might consider. There is a, a musical that is touring called The Molds That Changed the World. It's been on tour in the UK and in the United States. Um, and it's all about the discovery of penicillin by Alexander Fleming. Uh, and the, the goal of this musical is not only to tell that discovery story, but also to offer a glimpse into a dark future where bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. Um, for the performances, something that's really interesting is that they've been recruiting real scientists to get up on stage and participate. Um, so that's one way to spread the, the word and get you know, the community involved. Um, they also invite guest experts to talk before these performances with the audience about um, antimicrobial resistance. Um, so the, there's a company in the United Kingdom called the Charades Theater Company uh, that created this musical, and they have adapted it into a children's version that can be used in schools. And um, they're providing free resources for anyone who would like to put on this musical, different video tutorials and things like that. Um, so I have reached out to someone who is affiliated with this musical. Her name is Carrie Ann Jones Parr. She's the head of UK Science and Innovation Network. Um, she has information about this school program and development. And she says that there, um, there's been interest in India. And if you, know, if you guys are interested in potentially sharing this musical, producing it um, in your communities, that, um, that you can reach out to Carrie Ann for more information. Um, and she, I think she would also be a, a good person to know. She has some connections and knows about other initiatives that have been led by the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy and the AMR Resistance Fighters Coalition. Um, this is one, theater is one example of something that's interactive and fun that you could also produce um, short um, skits in schools um, on, your, on your own. So this is really just one example to get you thinking about ways to reach a younger generation. So there, there are a lot of opportunities for, for writing and serving as guests on different shows. So um, considering opinion pieces, op-eds, uh, podcasts, radio, and TV. Um, there are some considerations that I think apply to all of these different platforms. Um, you know, when, when, you're, when you're thinking about pitching a story, there are some things you want to consider. Um, first, you want to try to identify an outlet that is, produces the kinds of content that relates to science and health, the kinds of stories that you're interested in telling. So finding a good match for an outlet is important. Uh, what you really want to do too is review that outlet's content to see, is your story going to be a good fit? But also, is this something that they've already published? Um, is it a duplicate of a story that they've published? And if so, what, what else could you say that would be new? And if not, that might signal to you that it's a good time to pitch. Um, before contacting an editor or a producer at a news outlet or a radio show or a podcast, um, you, you want to look online and see if there are guidelines on their website about how to pitch. You know, sometimes there are very specific things that they look for in a pitch. Um, oftentimes they, they, they only want a paragraph, uh, a very short description of what your story is about because they would like to have the opportunity to work with you and craft that story in a way that's going to resonate strongly with their audience. Um, also, editors generally do not have a lot of time. <laughs> Some of them get a lot of pitches. So if it's brief and to the point, that can be very helpful. Um, uh, and another thing that I would like to add to is that uh, a lot of outlets um, do not want you to submit a story that's already written. You know, they they would rather that you you submit a, a, a pitch, which really is just your idea for a story, because they want to craft it with you um, and they want to help you refine it. And so some things that editors look for in a pitch is, is your story timely? You know, why, if they're getting a lot of pitches for stories, why is your story important to tell now? 
Um, is it original? Has this already been told before by their publication? Um, evidence is really important. So when you are pitching a story, you want to link to sources. You want to um, show that the information you're providing is accurate. Uh, another thing to consider is why are you the right person to tell this story? Do you have expertise in this area? And if you are talking, if you want to tell a story about people in your community, do you have access to those people um, to tell that story? So why are you the person to tell it? Uh, and then the other thing to consider is narrowing your pitch down to a, an angle and not a broad topic. Uh, and, and I will go over that now with some examples. Okay, so these are examples of broad topics. Um, topics are too general to pitch to an editor. And you're really gonna need to refine your story. Um, and, and so things like antibiotic resistance, vaccines, access, um, you need to figure out what you wanna say about these topics. Um, and that's gonna help um, your editor envision why your story would be important to its readers. And I'll give you some examples. So this is one example of how to take a broad topic and narrow it down. Um, this reporter, Fatik Power, is a journalist, a freelance journalist in India. And he wrote about vaccines for a publication called Undark, which is an independent nonprofit magazine. Um, but he took that really broad topic of vaccines and he narrowed it down into a story angle. And so his story angle is why did a vaccine for malaria, a leading global killer takes so long to produce. Um, so that was his specific story angle. And this is another um, example of a, a narrow story angle. Uh, Madeline Davies is a journalist in the United Kingdom. She wrote about antibiotic resistance for the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Um, that's an independent nonprofit organization that produces in-depth investigations um, to make a difference. In the world. And so Madeline took her broad topic of antibiotic resistance and she narrowed it down um, into a story angle um, that is why are Malawi's babies dying of antibiotic resistant infections? And so that, you know, in, in and of itself, she was able to talk about all the, um, the reasons why that was occurring and shed light um, on this larger issue. So um, I think one uh, way to get involved, actually, hold on for one moment. Okay, sorry, I skipped ahead. Um, one, one really great way I think to get started is to look into your university and local um, publications, those news publications, radio and TV um, outlets. Um, and why would you want to contribute to a university publication. There are a few different reasons. It is a great opportunity for you to educate your local communities. Some of these publications may have subscribers in your towns. Um, radio shows that are produced by universities um, sometimes have uh, radiuses that broadcast throughout the country or reach different provinces. Um, the university TV shows or it can be streamed online and you can share those globally. Uh, a lot of alumni receive updates from, and they wanna follow their university publications so you can reach people who've graduated um, and are no longer at the university. There are also uh, media, university media outlets are also training grounds. Um, they are, their goal is to help train future journalists and producers, and they're always looking for new content and guests and that's, how you can help. You know, you can come up with ideas and they will really appreciate that. Um, generally, universities, because they're smaller outlets, are less competitive to pitch. Um, and you can get experience writing and interviewing. Um, so this is this is a really great opportunity for you to, to refine your messaging and to, to build your clips. And the more um, experience you have and the more clips that you build, you, you start to... Um, improve your reputation and also um, prepare, prepare yourself to pitch to other outlets. Um, university media outlets um, can also help you build your network. 
So if you, you know, collaborate on a radio show or, or, you know, a TV show, you may meet people who you would want to connect with on future projects. And so, you know, maybe you want to produce a video, an educational video, and now you know students who have access to equipment um, and they have technical knowledge. So you guys can work together on potentially together on future projects. You can also consider local and national audiences. Again, news, radio, and television shows. Um, this is uh, some, some things that you would wanna consider would be to look at outlets that cover health-related stories or science-related stories. Um, you can pitch stories that you would like to write or produce, um, or you might have ideas that you think the team at that radio station or that news outlet could produce, and you just want to give them information and help provide access to the people that that story is about. Um, some of the benefits of local radio and TV shows include uh, the opportunity to reach people in their local dialects. Uh, you can reach a wide demographic that way, including the young and the elderly. Um, a lot of people listen to radio, people living in rural areas and cities. So you're increasing the, um, the demographics of the people that you want to reach. Um, there are a few examples here uh, on this slide. Um, the, the one on the left, Radio Musante, is based in Rwanda. And their programming is in uh, a language, Kenya Rwanda, to... Um, be able to connect with people in their communities. A, a recent story was focused on the Barrera district um, in which uh, the district will be helping to improve infrastructure, including um, helping um, to increase the amount of toilets, better um, building materials for families living in the rural sector. So that just goes to show that that radio station might be a good outlet um, for you because they're covering these kinds of issues. The other thing is that that kind of story about infrastructure development could lead into a, a story about um, antibiotic resistance. I mean, be having toilets, clean water, um, and better infrastructure helps with infection control. So that might be a way for you to connect with that, um, that radio show. Uh, there are a couple of other examples here. The TBC Taifa is a, a radio um, and TV um, show in Tanzania. They produce content in Swahili um, and Nation is a Kenyan newspaper. Um, so these are just some examples of some outlets, you know, based on where you are that you'd want to reach out to. And also consider that these can be shared online. So you may start with a local publication, uh, but that message can be spread globally. You may also want to consider global health outlets. Um, these outlets that I'll talk about uh, concentrate on public health issues and are shared throughout Africa and the world. Um, the Pakisisa Center for Health Journalism is an independent media organization that focuses on health and social justice issues across Africa. Um, and Pakisisa is a Zulu word that means scrutinize. Um, this really underscores the kind of reporting that they do. The reporters use reliable stats uh, from peer-reviewed journals to support their stories. Um, their stories are distributed uh, through multiple publications, including News 24, Daily Maverick, Financial Mail, Mail and Guardian. Um, they reach policymakers, academics, activists, political leaders, um, that can help shift policy, set, set national agendas, and define conversations. Um, DVEX is an independent news organization that reports on global health issues, um, and their goal is to spark dialogue between world leaders, the private sector, and the global development community. And DVEX partners with the World Economic Forum and the United Nations and other international organizations. So um, at the, the bottom of the screen, and, and again, you'll have this PDF file and you'll have the links, um, but that's just a reminder that if you want to reach out to, to these um, publications, uh, read their guidelines first, and so you'll understand how to do that. Um, I've been in touch with both, both of these publications, so 
Um, Bekisisa, um, Mia, Milan, and Joan Bandick are editors there, and they welcome your op-ed ideas. Um, they said they would work with you on developing your ideas. Um, so you can reach out to them and their email addresses are there. Uh, one thing that they did say is that because their editing process is extensive, um, they only accept op-ed submissions that they are certain will resonate with their audience. So again, that's important to go to their website, check out the kinds of stories that they write and ensure that you know what you're pitching will resonate with their audience. Um, and at DVEX, Honesty Pern is the opinions editor. You can reach out to Honesty with your, with your op-eds and there's also a page um, on the DVEX website that you can review before contacting her. Um, she, she gave a couple of suggestions for you. She said, make a clear and concise argument backed up with facts and data. And she said, what's really helpful is to go beyond why an issue is important to how people are making headway or what's needed to get there. You know, offer practical advice for global development practitioners. That's their audience. Um, and a strong call to action is also really helpful. Uh, there is another opportunity for you. There is a, a, a nonprofit newsroom called The Conversation that publishes research-based news. It operates a global network, including in Africa. Um, and the, the goal for, of The Conversation is to democratize academic research and make it easy to understand for the public. Um, so you know, they're, they're looking for news analysis and new discoveries. So if you would like to pitch to the conversation, um, the guidelines that they have, they're looking for um, PhD candidates. So are you currently in a PhD program at your university? Um, then you could qualify. And, and I've noticed that most of the PhD candidates pair up with a professor um, who has a PhD. And, um, and you can pitch different news stories and um, research stories they actually do not take opinion pieces, so no op-eds. Um, and there, again, there's a, on the, on the website, there is a guideline for how to pitch. You want to read their guidelines and make sure that you follow, uh, follow those and that you can qualify. Um, they, they're also um, very adamant about linking to sources. It's all fact. The story must be backed up by facts. Um, some benefits of the conversation if your pitch is accepted, uh, you would write the story with a veteran journalist and editor. Um, so that's a really fantastic professional development opportunity. All of the content is open access. It's free to read and republish. Um, so, so many of the stories that begin on the Conversation website are shared with thousands of newsrooms across the globe. Um, and uh, their statistic they give is that 40% of the authors who are uh, who publish their their stories on the conversation, they get interview requests from other publications. So that's a really great way to continue to educate is to be interviewed by other publications. Um, they also um, have a dashboard for analytics. So if you do publish a story with a conversation, you would have access to see how your story is being shared and viewed around the world. Um, Daniel told me uh, one, one outlet that's really popular is BBC Africa. And so um, you know, a lot of you might already be listening to the BBC. It's an independent news organization um, that seeks to educate people um, all around the world. And it has news, radio, and TV shows in more than 40 languages. Um, and I think the BBC would be a, a really good outlet to pitch ideas for their team of journalists um, and producers. So, um, you know, journalists and producers are always looking for the new story and they, they need to know who they can reach out to. So if there are patients or doctors or, you know, organizations and you have a good story idea, you can, um, you can send your ideas in and, you know, they might produce a story about that. Um, and there are different ways that you can submit to the BBC. You can submit um, online. They have a portal and there's the website there. Um, so if you have ideas, you can do that. You can also connect with the BBC on Twitter, WhatsApp, um, and you can email your, your stories. You can email photos, video, and audio. 
And then I wanted to share with you, um, there's a video that you might want to check out. Um, it's a webinar um, that's all about the perspective that editors have um, and how to pitch. And so there is an organization called SciCommerce. Um, it's a group for science communicators, people who are interested in educating about science. Um, it was founded um, at National Public Radio in Boston and uh, is currently hosted by Boston University. And um, if you go to their website, you can sign up to join their Slack channel. And I recommend that. It's a really good resource. There are forums to um, share information um, about science journalism. Uh, there is a writer's program and mentor chats. And so um, this link uh, is to an unlisted YouTube video that I recommend you check out. Uh, it will cover a lot of the information that we're that it, we're reviewing now in this webinar, but I think it's it's good to hear from the editors themselves. Um, and they provide advice on pitching. You know, these are editors from um, global publications, American Scientist, Knowable, The Conversation, Scientific American. So they'll tell you what they're looking for in a pitch and, and also um, why they might reject pitches. And so I think it's good to hear from their perspective. Um, and again, it's just more information that will will set you up for success. You know, and there are a lot of organizations that uh, focus specifically on antibiotic resistance um, to, to help get the word out. And these are your allies um, all around the world that would be a really good opportunity to collaborate with um, by looking at podcasts um, that, you know, are spreading the word about antibiotic resistance. Um, if you were to connect with them, you can learn from one another you can help share resources, help build each other's networks. Um, and this content, it streams. So you can share it with your local and global communities. Uh, so there are a couple of examples that I wanted to, to go over. The Antibiotic Resistance Awareness Podcast is a podcast that was started by Ethan Ree. He is a high school student in the United States, uh, in California. And he started this podcast to educate the younger generation about antimicrobial resistance. Um, and pictured there is Ethan dropping off some old medications. Um, and it's he created a drug take back initiative to educate about safe drug disposal. Um, I talked to Ethan about the AMR ambassadors program, and he would love to collaborate with you on an episode about global health. Um, so you are welcome to reach out or I can, I can put you in touch with Ethan if, if that's of interest to you. Um, another resource is One Health Trust. Um, it's a nonprofit research organization that's focused on infectious diseases and improving global health. Um, they produce a podcast called One World, One Health. Um, and the producer is Samantha Serrano. And she's very interested in global health episodes. Uh, so she would be a great person to reach out to if you have ideas for the podcast or if you want to be a guest on the show or recommend guests. Um, the, the other thing that I think would be really great to, to follow up on and maybe reach out to Samantha about is that um, they're working on some educational initiatives. And so Samantha told me that next year, uh, they're developing uh, one health lesson plans for different grades. So really looking at um, how uh, we can educate about antibiotic resistance and how it not only affects human health, but also the implications um, for agriculture and the ways that antibiotics are used. Um, and so they're developing lesson plans for different grades. She said they might have an internship opportunity, but um, that's not guaranteed right now, but that would be something to, to inquire about in case that's approved. Uh, another thing that Samantha wanted me to tell you about is that they are hosting um, webinars. And so you might want um, to follow them online um, and see when their, their next webinars are coming up. Um, but she said it would be a really nice way to learn about um, the African Society for Laboratory Medicine and Africa CDC, they have some guests that we're going to be um, on their on, on their webinar series. So that's something you might want to check out. So we talk a little bit about video. Um, uh, with video, 
one of the really powerful things is that um, you can tell stories that are really personal. And when people share their stories in their own words, it can have a, a really profound impact, um, you know, to, to raise awareness and to, and, you know, we, we really, we want, really want to underscore how important antibiotics are to, to human health and saving lives. And so what better way to, to do that than to have people tell their own stories, whether it be patients or scientists, um, community members, um, and that can help motivate action. So some, some things to consider are, uh, you know, if you're just getting started and you don't have experience with video production, starting with making short videos can be helpful. Um, they're also very shareable. Uh, you can stream them on YouTube. You can submit them to festivals. Um, short videos are also really um, helpful for educational screenings in schools. Uh, class, class periods are often short. And so having short videos um, can, can be really beneficial. Uh, the other thing to think about is maybe you have an idea for a documentary or a video, um, but you don't have the technical expertise. So maybe it's, it would be a good opportunity to collaborate with filmmakers. Um, you know, making videos can be very challenging. And so finding people with that, that technical expertise and access to video equipment could be really helpful. Um, you would all, it's also great to learn from veterans. Uh, so one example that I provided here is an organization called DocuBox. Um, it's based in Nairobi. And uh, the reason it was founded was to, to, to give support to filmmakers, um, to help them build their networks, um, and also offer funding. So they receive funding from organizations um, like the Ford Foundation. Um, so, you know, if you were to attend some of their events um, or look for like organizations or maybe connect with people at universities um, that could help you with your videos if you have an idea uh, but need help to pull it off uh, networking and pooling resources is a really a really good way to think about doing that um, there is a show called shamba shape up um, it's an educational and entertainment tv program and um, Shamba Shape Up pairs experts with small scale farmers across East Africa um, to help them adapt for a changing climate and to make their farms more productive and increase their incomes. Um, Shamba Shape Up is broadcast on Kenya's Citizen TV and also on YouTube. And the episodes are in Swahili and English. Um, and the reason I'm presenting this is that you know, this is one example that if you're interested in educating about antibiotic resistance, um, you know, oftentimes farmers use antibiotics. And so, you know, perhaps you might want to pitch an episode about, um, you know, or collaborate on an episode about antibiotic use in farming. So I reached out to the producer. Her name is Sophie Rotman. Um, they're in season 12 right now. And she said she would be interested in your ideas for educational outreach. So whether that's an idea for an episode or maybe something else. Um, so she she would love to hear from you. Uh, and again, I'd be happy to either put you in touch or you could reach out to Sophie directly. Um, but I'd, I'd like to show the promotional clip that they have for season 12 so you can get a sense for what Shamba Shape Up is all about. Um, this is the, the kind of opportunity that is a creative way to think about education and also to learn more about, potentially learn more about video production. Welcome to Shamba Shape Up. We have traveled all over East Africa to find hard-working farmers. We want to celebrate them while giving them the knowledge they need. So they can adapt and make their farms more productive even while the climate changes. We want to support them to get better yields and increase their income. We will see how farmers can benefit from our experts' advice. While learning from each other in so many ways. Join us on this journey and share in the farmer's experiences on the Shamba Shape Up Safari. All right, and I have one more slide. <laughs> uh, this is the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Uh, this is a story I showed earlier in the presentation. 
Um, but I wanted to highlight this. It's an independent nonprofit organization um, and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism collaborates with partners in African media outlets. Um, they investigate global health issues, including antibiotic resistance. They produce in-depth investigations. They have videos on their site that they produce. Um, this story here is about um, babies that are dying in, Mal in Malawi um, and because of resistant infections. And, and you know, it's an in-depth investigation until it really shines a light on the challenges that the community faces, infrastructure challenges, you know, people need clean water, they need toilets, they need access to bleach, they need access to antibiotics. Um, so, and then this was their angle on that story. Uh, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism will have a new um, antibiotic resistance AMR reporter starting next week. Um, and the impact editor, her name is Grace Murray. She said she would love to meet with you and explore some collaborations and uh, she said that they, they would be available sometime after December 1st. So if that is something that interests you, um, I can help you get in touch with Grace. And so that is the end of the presentation. I really wanted to thank you for inviting me to speak with you. I'm, I'm so proud of the work that you're doing and really grateful to your dedication to the cause. I hope these examples have inspired some ideas for collaborations and can support the work you're doing to educate um, and inspire action. Um, so I would like to open the webinar for questions. You're welcome to put them in the chat or you know, also turn your mic on and ask them if you can also put them in the chat. That might help me um, to understand the questions. Sometimes it's hard for me to hear over Zoom. Um, and I would love to learn more about your interests, how I can help you get connected and you know, I had had a conversation with Daniel where I, I you know, I, I had told him I'm, I'm happy to stay in touch. So if you have any questions moving forward after the webinar, you are welcome to reach out anytime. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. That is really great. I, you've really done a lot of research, gone out of your way and, you know, going all the way to even contact guys. Um, so I've just shared the presentation on our platform. Uh, so just uh, go through, there are so many good um, um, uh, good links there, good people whom you can reach out to and Robin is here uh, to support us. So we'd love to see collaborations, you know, I'm very happy to see, uh, you know, especially, if, you know, uh, as, uh, you know, reaching out and collaborating with the different people who have been, um, who have been shared there. And I also saw a comment on Shamba Shepa uh, um, uh, in the in the in the in the chat, and it's quite interesting because Shamba Shepa is quite very popular in Kenya. Anyway, uh, thanks so much, and I also want to recognize the presence of uh, Eva uh, uh, Gamendia, our previous guest speaker. I hope guys you remember her. And uh, there's also a request to share the presentation uh, via chat. That is by uh, Michael Graziano. So maybe Michael, you can just drop your email and I'll send it to you uh, after, uh, after the session. So thanks so much, everyone. I can see there are some questions. Uh, so maybe Robin, uh, we can try uh, Mike and if it doesn't, because uh, we have some hands. If it doesn't work, then maybe we uh, we we then go to chat. Sure, that's that's great. I I I am happy to answer questions. And also, uh, while Ava has her hand raised, I, I I will let Ava know. I I listened to her presentation to your group, and so I think I stole some of her ideas. Um, and I really appreciated Ava's talk on communication. So thank you for that, Ava. Yeah, thanks so much. Over to you, Ava. Hello, Eva. We, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Robin, yeah, I just wanted to say hi. Uh, even though we never met, like I know about your work and I, I really, um, I admire you. I want to be like you when I grow up because I really love the work that you've done uh, communications before and now you are working on AMR, which is very exciting. 
Um, I actually, my question, I don't work in the African region. I, I really appreciate all the, the suggestions that you are giving uh, these people and the possibilities are endless in how to communicate and how to co collaborate with the media. But my question to you is, as someone that has a background in communications and when you moved into the AMR sphere and you had to learn about AMR, what are the main um, materials and the main things that you use to to um, to learn about the complexity of this topic? Okay, that's a really great question. And um, I, I have a background in biology, so I, I don't have a PhD, but I have a, a, a bachelor's and I've always been interested in health and science issues. And so um, that's permeated my work over the years. Um, but in specifically about how did I learn about antimicrobial resistance? Um, I, my husband is a researcher and he's in this field. And through his work, I had learned about companies that were going out of business. Mm -hmm. um, and so I learned about it from uh, the standpoint of the challenges that the developers um, face and creating these new antibiotics. And, and, and I always knew about the, the issue of antimicrobial resistance and the deaths, but I thought it, it was really curious to me um, that companies were going bankrupt. And so that inspired me to look more into the economic challenges. And I did research, uh, oh, just did a lot of online research, read a lot of stories, and I started connecting with different organizations um, just to follow them online. Um, and so I was interested in this from a storytelling perspective, but for about a year, I was, I was researching it on my own. And because I had been following these organizations, um, when the position was posted, um, through the Carbex social media channels, I had been following Kevin Outerson and I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity for me. Um, I'm interested in this topic and, you know, it's, it's such an important global, global health issue. Um, and then I have a communications background. So um, I applied for the position. I thought it would be a way for me to use my skills to help a good cause. Um, but, it, but in terms of the resources, it was just, you know, I it was really self-taught um, because I thought that, you know, it was uh, a, just a real challenge that the developers face and it's really unique to the field. And that it was my curiosity that drove me to do the research. Um, but I think mainly I, I looked at um, short documentaries that were produced um, research articles and a lot of news stories online. And then I followed a lot of groups on social media and that's how I, I learned more. That's, that's very interesting. I, yeah, it's great. It's great. Maybe we can collaborate at some point or something. I always, I mean, I follow what Carbex is doing. We would like to do something together at some point. So yeah. And I noticed that I think Kevin was your first, um, yeah. guest on your, <laughs> I know it's, we started very high up on the podcast with having Kevin as our first kind of <laughs> official when we I, I knew absolutely nothing about communications. I don't have a background. I'm a biologist, did a PhD on evolution of bacteria, but I always loved podcasting and radio and media and I'm a photographer in my free time so like all these kind of things came together and I've learned a lot over the past four years. But yeah, starting with Kevin was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> interesting. We well, we really appreciate what you're doing, and um, th thanks for everything that you're you're doing to to promote on um, this important topic. And I, we we think that the work that you're doing is really high quality. So thank you, and I'm happy to talk anytime. For sure, and uh, yeah, and again, thank you to Daniel to have amazing uh, speakers like he always is able to put together. So yeah, thank nice to meet you, Robin. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you, thank you so much, Eva. It's really great to have you today. Um, and Robin, you. You, you also did a, a movie. Maybe you can share about it and maybe people can uh, um, maybe check out for it. Um, uh, we'll then go to uh, Mwitupa, uh, maybe as you comment on that. Uh, Mwitupa, your hand was up, then I think we'll go to Zachary. Over to you. Uh, good evening and good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. And I wanted to say thank you very much, Robin, for your presentation. It was really insightful. And it's amazing to have you and you as well, Eva. I wanted to ask you, seeing as you had a background in, um, in biology, but then you went like a complete 360 and then uh, began to do film. Is there any principle that you took um, with your studies in biology that like helped you 
And how was it making such a shift like career wise and just like profession wise? Oh, that's a that's a good question. I, I think that these journeys are um, not really well defined in life. You know, we have ideas about what interests us and things that we'd like to pursue. I know that um, when I was really when I was younger and in high school, I, I always did really well in my math and science classes. And so those teachers encouraged me to to pursue medicine and science. And so I think that that that's pretty powerful, actually, when people give you words of encouragement <laughs> and like that, that can really, um, you know, it can really, I, I think, shape how students view themselves and their abilities and some of their, um, you know, some of the opportunities that lie ahead. So uh, I went, went through that path. Um, I, I got my degree in biology and the goal initially for me was to go to medical school. And um, I think I just had doubts about what that path would, um, would involve and what that future would entail for me. I think I had, um, I, I really liked the idea of helping patients, um, but I think I had a fear that um, of, of taking care of them to the best of my abilities. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of responsibility involved in medicine. I have a lot of respect for doctors. Um, but I, I had back to your question about how did I get down the path then into, um, into film production, you know, it was a little bit of a winding path after I studied biology. I, I worked for residence life for a little while. So I, I managed some residence halls and what, wanted to really think about what really interests me and what some opportunities were. Uh, I never thought of film as a viable career option. <laughs> it wasn't something that uh, when I was younger, I, I anticipated I would get involved in, but I, I just liked movies and I liked photography and I liked story storytelling. Um, so it, you know, I, I thought about, you know, what, what, what were my passions and how I could get more involved and go down a different path. Uh, so I, at that point, I, I thought it would be important to get some really fundamental skills. Uh, so I applied to uh, uh, master's programs and I eventually en enrolled in Boston University's program. And that, that did give me a lot of technical expertise. I think one of the benefits of going to, um, to school for a program like that is the network that you build um, in addition to the, um, the technical um, expertise. But I, I think with something like film and you know podcasts and writing, I think that you don't have to go to school and get a formal education. Um, really, it is the it, the kinds of projects you work on and the practice. So um, the lessons that I learned in you know working initially after my graduate program, I I was recruited to work for Boston University to produce videos and write for BU's publications. Um, but what I learned there is that if you are always working on new projects and coming up with ideas, you just get better and better. Um, and so that's what I would impart is get involved in things that you care about. You know, I had the wonderful freedom to pitch stories that interested me. And so um, I had fun making, you know, those videos and writing. Um, so that's, that's what I would say is like, get involved in things that you care about um, and then you know, produce co new content regularly and, and then you'll improve that way. Um, in terms of how biology and my science background um, has helped me, I think that, um, well, I, th I think that that scientific process is certainly helpful in many different fields because it really make, it helps you become a critical thinker um, and also find appropriate information and evidence that, that you can use for your stories. So I think that's important. I think also having a basic understanding um, of science, if you want to communicate about science, is really helpful too. One of the things that I think is great is that if I'm working on a story with scientists and it's really technical, I have enough knowledge that helps me to understand it, but I don't have so much knowledge that I can ask, you know, quote unquote, dumb questions <laughs> that would help the average listener or, you know, or reader. Um, so I think having a basic background in science is certainly helpful um, for, for communicating about health and science. Um, but I, I, I think that, you know, careers are, it's interesting and, and I would encourage all of you to talk to people who are pursuing different careers and ask them about how they got to where they are. Um, and I think the lessons I've learned is really just to keep your options open. Um, some things will 
opportunities will come up that you never anticipated. Um, and so being open to different opportunities, um, I think is, is really important. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. I hope much for you, your question has been addressed. Yeah, and um, thanks so much. Over to Zachary. Zachary, you can go ahead. Thank you, um, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Oh, thank yes, you. I thank can you hear. Very much. Thank you, um, thank you very much, um, Robin, for your uh, wonderful presentation. Um, your wonderful insights and um, your journey, the Kagan, all the ways. Thank you very much. And my question is, over time, I've learned that um, storytelling, effective storytelling is one of the radical ways we could um, tell people about antimicrobial resistance, uh, making them understand what um, EMI is and the kind of tool they provide. So um, for a student like me that uh, is measuring in um, medical physics, um, medical laboratory science, I know I have, um, um, literally, I have a little knowledge about communication. And I really want to kind of um, effectively complete EMR to get people to so what are the kind of um, relevant courses or relevant materials you might recommend, maybe trainings you might have to uh, uh, something like that. Thank you. So I your um your audio cut in and out a little bit. Do you mind also putting the the um question in the chat? So I, I hear that you are a student and I heard that you wanted some more materials, I think, for AMR education, but I couldn't quite hear the full question. And can you hear me now? I, I can hear you now. Okay, uh, my question is that uh, as students and majoring in medical sciences, you know, I really have um, a little knowledge on communication. So um, over the time, I've learned that Effective communication is one of the vital tools we need to communicate um, AMR to people so people will understand the impact and the burden on, 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 on global health. So um, what are your, let's say, advices or um, materials you might recommend to kind of hone my skills in communication, something like that? So I'm going to repeat back what I think you, you asked. So you want to help your students with communications? Myself, like I want to help myself. Again. I am majoring in, in medical sciences, and okay. I really have I really have um, low knowledge or experience or background in communication in communication in general. So I have learned over time that effective communication is part of the things that makes people understand a story. If you communicate the story very well, they kind of understand what you are saying, something like that. So. I am asking for a professional advice on maybe materials or something I might need to kind of hone my communication skills, something like that. Okay, thank you. So you personally have a background in medical sciences and you want some resources to help develop your communication skills. You want, um, because you think it's important to communicate about antimicrobial resistance. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, that that's a really great question. I think first, I I would think about well, what kinds of communications are you interested in, and then what you could do is you could look to, you know, whether for instance you wanted to write an opinion piece or a guest article, um, doing a lot of reading and um, in that area and seeing that by reading it helps you to improve your writing skills. Um, there are also, you know, depending on what your interests are, if you are interested in writing op-eds, there are resources online um, that can guide you through that process. Uh, oftentimes, there are guidelines to, to help. Um, I, th I think it's practice, for sure. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, in terms of video, um, radio, podcasts, there are ways that you can think about it. You can think about either um, serving as a guest, you know, on different shows, or do you want to get that actual hands-on production experience? And then I would say, um, you know, looking at some online tools and can, and collaborating with people who have that technical expertise can really help out. So I think I, I would say like, 
find, think about what you want to learn, what kinds of communications you're interested in, the types of media, the types of outlets, like what are your goals? Think about, you know, how you want to reach your audience and that should help you drive where you want to go and the kinds of platforms you want to use. And then once you narrow that down, um, there are a lot of resources online, um, but I think reading and watching movies and listening to podcasts, it gives, it'll start to give you a lot of ideas about how other people are telling their stories. Um, and, and that will inform how you want to tell your stories. Um, and then, you know, it will also inform where you're looking for more materials. But if, if there's something that if you, if, and, and this goes for everyone on the call, like if you have a specific project in mind and you would like some input on your project or, you know, you want to find more resources, you can email me um, and I'd be happy to, you know, work, help to um, guide a specific project or idea that you have. But yeah, there's a lot of material online. And I, I would say like, start there and think about what kinds of stories you want to tell. And then um, just do a lot of reading and a lot of listening and watching. And, and, and that'll help you think about, um, you know, what, what, how you want to shape your approach to storytelling. But I'm happy to follow up with you. <laughs> if you have more questions, please reach out to me anytime. If you have specific questions and want specific resources, I'm I'm happy to help. Thank you, thanks so much, Robbie. I we don't want to eat on to you a day so much because just that. Um, so thanks so much. I really appreciate, and uh, it was a very great session as usual. Um, thank you for for you know for always going above and beyond. Uh, you know support and uh, always being very kind and we really thank you for that i'd just like to offer the session to my co-coordinator anastasia who is uh, uh is coordinating things with me too maybe for a word then i think we can hand it over to you uh robin for the final uh, one thank you over to you anastasia thanks very much daniel um well before Thank you very much, Robin. I think I, I really enjoyed this session. Thank you for sharing with us some of these interesting projects that are being done around the world. Then uh, thank you very much to our former, yeah, one of our previous speakers, Eva, for joining us today. And we ambassadors, thank you for your consistent commitment towards um, attending this session, willing to do more um, in the fight against AMR. So that's it for me. Probably all back to you, Robin. Well, thank you very much. It, you know, it's a, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be speaking with you all. And, you know, I really appreciate the work that you are doing and I, I will follow up with Daniel, but if, like I said, I, I'd really, really like to, um, to, to let you all know that I'm open to talking with you about these projects and some of the examples that I gave, I can follow up with the editors and the producers. Um, so if you, if any of those ideas um, are of interest to you, um, and you would you'd like more information, if you could connect with Daniel, um, that would be great. And then I, I can reach out to Daniel and we can figure out how we want to move forward and, and get you connected to some resources that might be helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much, Robin. And uh, thanks so much, everyone, for joining today. We really do appreciate to our visitors who joined us. Um, and thanks so much, Eva, for joining us. It has really been great uh, seeing you with us again, and we are really uh, happy to have you today. And thank you, Anastasia. And I wish us all a wonderful day, as we've had, you know. Uh, and today, I think I've learned about, you know, uh, sometimes opportunities are that just there. You just need to knock on the doors. And uh, you see so many opportunities. So, and I believe, uh, if you position yourself well and clearly articulate what you want to do, um, you know, you'll be able to do it. Thank you so much. And I wish us a wonderful evening and have a wonderful day, uh, Robbie. Thank bye you, bye. Daniel. Thank you, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. bye bye Thank you. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.